Hey guys, Rob from Georgia, aka VHS82 Apostrophe here with you, and joining me not too far from the great land of Canada, Glenn, aka DDG Reviews, representing the one and only Bay of Blood podcast. And let's not forget body bags being represented as well. Fresh off our very first black and white nights commentaries, we're digging into some Italian goodness with episode two. As we look at Michele Sauvé's stage fright from 1987. So get the snacks and adjust the way, just to adjust the way you color off your freaking TV sets and settle back for what ought to be one hell of an entertaining evening. What's up, man? Hell yeah. Not much, man. Uh, just living, <laughs> surviving in the apocalypse. <laughs> yes. And we need to just say real quick how much we miss Will missing yeah. a second commentary track in a row here yeah but you know he's doing the good work for people so yeah we, uh, we all appreciate that so <laughs> three two one go bill brock yep. presents yeah there we go nice mm -hmm. no right off i have to say man as a kid i don't know what it was but seeing film Raj, it just, maybe it's that word rage in there. I don't know. But it, just, it just stuck on me. And I just. Yeah, it, it, it's just something about it in there. Always felt somewhat attached to that. And of course, seeing the uh, title of Aquarius is kind of mysterious. Yeah. Boswell with a score. It's a it's a great uh, score too. It is. And there's something about these titles, just you know, simple. I ah, see. This is working already for me. Yeah. I'll be honest, though, the first time I ever, it seemed like the first time I ever saw this, the beginning threw me a little bit, just, you know, I wasn't, wasn't really prepared for that whole stage thing. Yeah. Hey, baby, you got the time? <laughs> yeah, man, it's been years since I've seen this. And this is uh, Barbara... Pisty, right? Right off the bat? I, th I think this so, yeah. the main character, yeah. Of course, David Brandon, man, he's uh, uh, the, the, the stage director. Man, I just, I don't know, he's one of my favorite favorite guys yeah. to watch in this movie. Here we go. Yeah. See, when I was a kid, I was probably like, what the heck, man? What is this? What am I watching? <laughs> now I have an 80 clue what was coming. Yeah. It all works, though, doesn't it? Guys. Okay, it's funny how the smoke seems to be more... Oh, now, see, he oh, he looks like he was made for black and white. Yeah, he see, really he does. He does too now. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. I've never, I've never seen, I've never really interpreted David Brandon's character uh, 
same as a lot of people. A lot of people, you know, just, um, oh, he's the, you know, his greediness, selfishness uh, to capitalize on um, this murder that'll happen. And I, I just never really saw him as the bad guy, I guess. Yeah. As much. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it really looks like when you're looking at it in black and white, it looks like a, like a, I don't know, like, like a '50s movie, and it just works. <laughs> Erotic. Yep. <laughs> and there's something kind of creepy about that mask, honestly. Oh, it's easily one of the best, best ever. There is something intimidating about it, especially when we see it on the killer. Yeah. By the way, did you know who is uh, uh, uncredited as the uh, wearer of that mask throughout? No, who? George Eastman. Nice. He not only uh, had a hand in writing uh, the treatment for this, but of course, you know, um, if uh, there are any uh, lovers of Italian cinema, of course, we know that George Eastman is the beast from Anthropophagus. Yep. And, uh, of course, absurd. <laughs> uh, but yeah, he is the the writer on this film, but he is uh, uncredited for uh, being under the mask. So probably at the moments where the killer seems most um, um, it's a good word, intimidating. Yeah, probably because Eastman's under there. Yeah. Love that black cat, Lucifer, man. Oh, yeah. The funny thing is, there's probably people that would see this movie now and see the that telephone and have no clue what it was. <laughs> and that makes me kind of sad. Like, it's a public telephone. Oh, well, how do you text with one of those? Yeah, I'm really liking this in black and white. It gives it, like, a, a timeless feel. Giovanni Lombardo. Yep. Is Brett. Of course, a lot of us know him as Bob from City of the Living Dead. Yep. I love man. He's awesome, man. Yeah. He's, he's so freaking <laughs> awesome in this movie. I forget. This is why I love all the characters in this movie, man. Yeah. It's just so much fun to watch. It's, uh... There's no one in here that's really, at least to me personally, no one that's really that annoying. No. No, I mean, and that's, uh, I don't know if that's a mark of good writing or if that's a mark of good acting. Probably both, but you know. <laughs> oh, I love the cramped shirt. I ought to mention too early on that Joe, uh, D'Amato, of course, his producer, mm -hmm. and Film Raj was his um, was his little company. Mm -hmm. It, 
Yeah. It's just like blowing my mind how good this looks in black and white. <clears throat> Love this. <laughs> By the way, I have to say, mm-hmm. we, if, if you ever happen onto an extra copy of Cemetery Man, you really need to let me know. Okay. I have been wanting that for so long. It's a damn good movie, isn't it? Let me know when we get to the point about earning enough money to buy a This is great. This is great. <laughs> See, you know, there you go. I mean, this uh, sanitarium is literally five minutes. Yeah. And you have the issue of they're not allowed to go in. They're not allowed to leave. And so they're violating a major, major guideline Mm -hmm. by leaving and so you're only going five minutes down the road and i know a lot of people that well why do you go to a insane asylum to have your ankle well the place is five minutes down the road yeah and they're trying to get back without anyone knowing they were gone (laughs) now you recognize uh willie here from anything else just want to get a better look at his face <laughs> He's so... who is it? Well, he's the coroner or a coroner in zombie. Oh, he's, yeah. He's... He's one of the seance members in City of the Living Dead. He's the voodoo priest, I believe, in After Death or Zombie 4. <laughs> and he was also in Absurd. I knew I knew him from somewhere. I just couldn't place it. Probably, I don't know. He looks the most he looks now, I think, in uh, Zombie 4. Ah, yeah. it's amazing, you know. When you, well, yeah, I mean, there's our, our main antagonist. Yep, Mr. Irving Wallace. <laughs> Dude, it's a serious badass man. Yeah. Dude, he is psychotic, man. <laughs> he is intimidating. You know, he's almost kind of like, man. He's almost kind of like. Uh, I hope this isn't blasphemous, but he's almost kind of like. Michael Myers was under the mask, man. Yeah. And I love this, too. I have to admit, this is one of my favorite scenes in the movie. Mm. I love just the imagery, man. This is... Uh, <laughs> this this predator, man. That, that This is like foreshadowing what's going to happen in the uh, theater house. Yeah. It's a lionfish, right? Yeah. I always got the biggest kick out of this scene. I don't know why. Just mm. it looks great in black and white too. This is like a it's like a standout scene in black and white. The music, man. The music is just. It is damn cool. I'm in freaking Boswell. <laughs> you know he did uh, Hardware and uh, Dust Devil for Richard Stanley. Oh, nice. I find it funny that, like, you know, a a psychiatric hospital and their doors are just open. 
can just walk in. <laughs> you know, you would have thought maybe, you know, a guard or or something, but no, just, we'll just open this door, step right in. <laughs> You're really mean. I can't remember. I think she has a, uh, she's a spot on the production staff somewhere. I can't remember where. Ah. Man, it's been so long since I've seen this. I'm watching it like a new movie. I keep, I, I, I got to keep remembering because there's a commentary. got to talk. <laughs> You know, it's funny, uh, Irving Wallace, who, uh, of course, we'll find out he was an actor himself who uh, <clears throat> massacred what I think it was like 16 people on a soundstage. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's funny. He reacts. Uh, he reacts to this situation. The only other time I think I've seen something like this was the way uh, in Halloween 4 when Michael, the way Michael Myers reacts in the ambulance when he uh, when they begin talking about his little cousin. Yeah. Or niece, I guess what it is, niece, right? Something. Yeah. That moment of like kind of uh Yeah, where his his hands just sort of fist clench. Yeah. I love freaking Bra David Brandon in this. I love. Yeah. You know the dude, I mean, he's only looking out for I mean, yeah, he looks out for his own interest, but he looks out for the interest of the play and those who have a part in it. Yeah. He only wants the best for it. And so... Yeah, this dude's having way too much fun rubbing her legs. Oh, yeah, well, cool. I, I doubt he has to go that <laughs> that high to fix her ankle, you know? It's like, oh, yes, uh, your ankle is injured. I must go right up your thigh. Because that's where the pain really comes from. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, you know, killer's smart enough to put like uh somebody in the bed, you know? See, that's the kind of dialogue, man. That <clears throat> just... Yeah. You you know this guy's not screwing around. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, yeah. 
That's just one of those great scenes. It's just, you know, like, you know, at that point, nothing good is going to happen, at least for them. For us, is a completely different story, but. See, I get it why people really start hating him right now, but you know, his yeah. there are certain points where his attitude will change towards well that um that girl in particular. Yeah. As the uh, reality of the situation becomes all that apparent. He's not as bad as as you know. I think the thing is he's just kind of like a jerk. Not necessarily like a like a a bad guy, but like a kind of jerky. That's a beautiful shot. And again in black and white, rain just pops. <laughs> like that oh, damn there he chat. is. You saw him run right in front of the car. It was beautiful. <laughs> I'm telling you, this scene coming out, man, when I was a kid, man, just freaking floored me, man. Yeah. <laughs> now that might be the closest you almost get to a an, an Argento style kill. Yeah, that's very Argento esque, to say the least. Boy, things about to get real here. Now this guy's the creep, man. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like, what would he thought he was going to get a piece or something, and then. <laughs> I don't know why that guy kind of remind, remind, reminds me of Harvey Weinstein. Huh. It, maybe it's just the look, you know, I don't know. My cat! Hmm. That's another really good shot right there. Yeah. Now, here, here's about the point where you're watching this for the very first time, and all you're really used to is the standard American slasher. Yeah. You know right here in a moment you're, you're in for something different. Yeah. And it's so simple. Yeah. Dude just left her there, man. Yeah. 
You need I to mean, pick her yeah. up, hide her somewhere. You expect the typical slasher thing, you know, the the I've mentioned it before, you know, like the corpse room when yeah. the killer takes all the bodies and puts them in one room. Uh, not here. It's just kind of like, yeah, she's dead. He just leaves her there, man. Yeah. <laughs> she's like, I'll leave her there with the trash. He's just psychotic, man. He is absolutely. That's the, that's kind of the great part. You know, I mean, there. Oh, this is, this, this looks so great. It does. It really does. It's like watching a whole new movie. <clears throat> and the fact, let's be honest, like, like I said, this could, this looks like it could have been filmed in the 1950s with how it looks in black and white and with what everyone's wearing and everything. Yeah. With the exception the hair, of the, the hairstyles, you know? Yeah, the hairstyle, you know, take take that away, you know. But I mean, like, look, like, look at some of these shots, you know. You could totally see it, like, in like a nineteen fifties like film noir or something. Yeah, yeah. I love this rain. I really do. It just, it's just kind of awesome. See, you know, it just begs the question: What happens, man? If they, if they all just disband like they ought to, yeah, what does this nut job go do, man? What what, what does he? Then I think it'd, it'd turn into your basic, you know, slasher like stalking everyone down one by one, sort of thing. I like uh, it's a bit different, you know. And I mean, like, if they would have just, like, all left and went home, see, just, like, wander around and just, I mean. Yeah. I like how they sort of contrast, you know, on the one, one – moment guy's like a real super creep but then yet he's sort of like i don't think this is a good idea yeah but then on the other this guy is you know obviously manipulating the situation but then he's gonna have slight character shifts yeah i mean i guess that's the thing you know it's it's like i said it's good i guess you'd say good writing you know it's uh it's showing what's the word I'm looking for? Character development. It's it's you know, on the one side it's very self aware of the films around it, but yet it takes itself so serious. Yeah, I, I love that. You know, it's the sort of thing, how easy would it be to go into, like, al- almost parody with a situation like this? And the fact that it doesn't, I like. I know there's been a murder, but let's keep going.
show business. Well, good night, everybody. <laughs> Peter, open the door. <laughs> open the door. All right. Yeah, it probably would have been better if they all just left, wouldn't it? You know it's you know it's good because like we're we're not talking we're just yeah. watching. <laughs> you know he kind of you know in a weird way he kind of reminds me of Carl Denham's character in King Kong. Oh yeah, completely. He is like he he like is that character. You could almost imagine him saying, uh, "We got we have to finish this show. We'll give all the money to her family." Yeah. Their their intentions aren't so that different. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean his actions literally bring a killer into their midst, you know, Den, of course, you know, brings, you know, Kong into the city. Yep. <laughs> Good old Mi Mickey uh, Knox? I think so. And uh, Michaela Soway, her cameo. <laughs> Our director. I always love it when, you know, directors do a cameo. I just, uh, I don't know. There's just something about it, you know? See, even here in this room, just, oh, it just... Mm -hmm. It has this otherworldly... Uh... It does. <laughs> Freaking brat man. He, you know, it's funny. He's your comedy relief without being comedy relief. Yeah. Even how he will react to being blamed for what's about to happen here. Yeah. Oh my God, this looks so beautiful. It really does. I mean, more people need to do this, honestly. People should make like a whole thing out of watching flicks in black and white. This music. It really is awesome. Is there a vinyl of this, do you know? Yeah, I'm pretty sure, without looking it up, I'm pretty sure I've seen it. Nice. Definitely seems like one to be worth having.
Yeah, the original soundtrack by uh, Simon Boswell, fifty bucks on Amazon. That's not bad, honestly. I I don't know what would. Ooh, damn. Not such a good price over here. <laughs> over here, there's one used copy for sale for two hundred and seventy nine forty eight. Well, over in uh, the UK, it's uh, only 23 pounds. It's not bad at all. The shots of the rain. There's just something about rain and black and white that just oh, it go. just here's pops. That that mask, man. That really does have that Harvey Weinstein look. Oh, this is crazy. Yeah. Just stand there, grab her. like, okay. <laughs> the anthropophagus approaches. Yep. And you know part of him's thinking, now this is acting. Where is 
Where did you put the key, damn it? She, the funny thing is, he probably killed her by doing that. We've got to find the key. We you know, of all the people here, he is the he is the coward, man. Yeah. You're screwed. Oh, yeah. I don't know, man. I was there's something ominous about this that wall right there, man. Yeah. <laughs> I'll just eat this. I mean, when you think of it, I mean, you couldn't be in a worse situation because anything the cops hear coming from inside would be like, oh, they're just rehearsing. Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's even if they heard anything. I mean, yeah, I've worked in a uh, in a stage uh, house when I was a kid. Mm-hmm. I volunteered for uh, quite a few shows. Those things are about as soundproof, man. Yeah. I was just thinking, you know, that money actually looks just a little bit more real in black and white. Yeah. The one thing in color, it does look really fake. Yeah, I mean, that's the sort of thing. Black and white seems to strip the fakeness off of just about everything. Yeah. Money, effects, you know. Everything, it just sort of works. Love how he just takes his time, man. Yeah. Here, I'll give you ten bucks. Leave me alone, please. I also find it kind of neat that th- those were all tens. <laughs> you know, I mean, nowadays they don't—they, you know, be all hundreds sort of things. This looks really good, man. It's like they've almost come out of shadows. Just the idea of candlelight. Yeah. Everything is just kind of working, isn't it? Thank you. 
Ooh, uh, there's George Eastman right there. Photograph. I've never recognized that before. <laughs> it's the Anthropophagus photograph. That's awesome. That's freaking crazy. I've never noticed that before. <laughs> This is from some old famous war movie, something like the Battleship Potomkin, something like that. Nice. <laughs> Looking at that old power drill, man. No, oh, yeah. See, look at, I mean, he's not, he's not, he's not as bad as. Yeah. I mean, he is, I mean, next, next to Irving Wallace, I mean, David Brandon is the uh, alpha. Yep. Everything is working. And you know it's good when, you know, you're, you're, you know, you're, we're doing a commentary and we're not talking. Oh, 
Second best use of a drill in an Italian horror movie. Again, man, he doesn't care. He just leaves it, man. Yeah. That's what makes it work. The fact that he just leaves it. Now, see, like, here's at the moment where for, for, for. It's game on now, man. I mean, you figure at this point, if you just stay right next to Peter, you, you just have this feeling you got at least a chance. Yeah, very true. I mean, how, I many, mean freaking, uh, how many horror movies are like, they have a character like that, where you just know. Yeah, they're pretty much going to survive. <laughs> You know, it's too bad they couldn't have like solidified a, a, a real plan. Yeah. And they might have if they want to get if they don't get caught off guard by actually seeing him here in a minute. Yeah, for sure. I mean it... <sighs> they sort of overextend themselves when they go into pursuit instead of just laying out a trap or something. Yeah. Cause they got the numbers, man. The numbers are on their side. Oh, yeah. In theory, one guy should be easy pickings for, like, how many are left there? Is there five, I think? Three. One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, five of them. You know, they should be able to take out one guy, no problem. I mean, even a crazy, but, you know. See, it's almost like it's almost kind of like he shows himself intentionally just to makes you wonder if that's actually the case. I mean, it is kind of nice to see people doing something proactive. Yeah, you don't get that very often in movies. No, usually it's like, yee, run away. <clears throat> see, if you're watching this in 88, even 89, I mean, it's just so many things work against what you're so accustomed to seeing. Yeah, exactly. Peter's like piss, man. Yeah. It's like, damn it, you ruined my show. So she she might be like one of the worst characters in here. Yeah. <laughs> and even then, she's still kind of likable. You know what I mean? There's still kind of a bit of something there.
bit of foreshadowing. <laughs> Might be one of the greatest scenes ever, ever. When that when that happened. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you'd think that would have been a giveaway, but you know. Oh, right here. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> I mean, the black and white almost makes it worse. <laughs> like, I got a hammer. I'm going after him, damn it. Oh, this is beautiful. It really is. Whoa! <laughs> you know what? I, I'm putting that right up there, honestly, with... Um, Especially in black and white with, uh, you know, uh, in The Exorcist 3. That scene with the, the big scissor things. I'm putting that up with it. just comes out of nowhere. Here's the thing. Did he throw her into him on purpose? I don't know. I struggle with that. There's something about the black and white and these scenes that just make it work. You know, like the head just flying off there. It was just like, it just worked. Yeah. So at this point, we're down to what? Two and a half? No, no. One and a half. The other girl's barely alive. Yep.
So it seems to be like a, a dream like quality. Yeah. It really does. And there's something about that, just, you know, like, empty stage, you know? Kind of creepy. You always get the feeling from her, like, this 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 notion of, is this even happening? Like, she just has this... Yeah. Which is probably what saves her life. Mm-hmm. She is, man, she's something to look at. Mm. She keeps reminding me of something. I, I don't know why, but she keeps reminding me of, um, what's her name? Uh, Barbara Steele. I don't know why. Because she doesn't really look like her. No. But yeah, I see why you say that. I, I don't know what it is, but you know. This is brutal. It really is. Like, where do you think? <laughs> Maybe it's just me, but it didn't look like her. The cut was that bad when it first happened. You know, it seemed much more. Like it's opened up or something in the midst of everything going on. I don't know. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, man. <laughs> sure. There really is something about that mask. And it's just how it slowly pushed that knife in, you know? Like, in the meantime, I think I look like James Dean. <laughs> <laughs> I always think it would have been funny if you could, if you could like get like an actual actor to say, and I look like such a body and it's the actual actor. Like if you could get Marlon Brando to do a role where he, where he says like, yeah, and I look like Marlon Brando. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it would just be kind of, you know, 
I mean, it was kind of like that uh, when Lon Chaney Jr. delivers that line in Spider Baby when she's talking about uh, when the girls talking about werewolves and werewolves and stuff, and he's like, you know, there's a full moon tonight. <laughs> they all sort of like look at it. It's one of those lines that can be so freaking cheesy, but it works brilliantly in that movie. Yeah. And for him to give that line, it's just <laughs> it's awesome. I mean, when, when you look at this, like when you look at like all the signage and everything, yeah, I was just thinking that it all looks like you know yeah. 1950s yeah. type signs and everything. So if, yeah, if you just took hey. out the slightly modern like haircuts and everything, you could in black and white this could pass for like a 50s, hey. 60s. And you think about um, I don't know if you've ever really thought about. I was just thinking to myself, just um, aside from how brutal this film gets at points and mm-hmm. the slight nudity, it really it's a clean movie. It is. Which is amazing because it's so freaking brutal. It, it's, it, it's just uh, – it's a reminder that these things – you don't you don't have to go excessive on a lot of – things i mean no. stage right is the perfect example of I, I mean being restrained in some areas while being a bit more you know yeah what the right word is um excessive i guess man. Yeah, it's it's it is it is relentless man at points mm-hmm. but you know there's no you know no stupid uh awkward uh um, love making scenes or I it's just it's just a straightforward yeah sort of in your face bludging you in your face yep <laughs> She is literally just caught up in this dream state right now. Yeah. And the way she's holding that gun, you know. I love that. Going to pull it with two tri- two two fingers. <laughs> but I guess, really, if you were like, you know, if you had no knowledge of firearms, really, and you were in this situation and you were like kind of like in a quote-unquote, like, dream-type state, you would carry something like that, wouldn't you? You wouldn't, like, you know, be carrying it like a trained marksman or anything. Yes, that's not the key. And the idea that she's, I mean, she's been knocked out. She's been unconscious. Yeah, so she's probably got a concussion at least. That was a great shot. Yeah. And he seems in his psychoticness to be unaware that there's still one more. Yeah. Roaming around. Which is an interesting dichotomy all in of itself. She's sort of wandering. He's wandering. They're really, she's aware of him, but he doesn't seem to be aware of her. Yeah. Yeah. So in a sense, if she just plays it really super careful, I mean. Yeah. (laughs) 
I love that, just carrying an arm. He sort of has this really, like, weird, restrained, psychoticness about him. Yeah. You know, like that, uh, unlike the killer from Black Christmas, who's just like a freaking animal, man. Yeah. I mean, he's psychotic. He's like just, he's like that animal that hides up there in the attic and just, <laughs> Lucifer. You gotta love that. The cat just eating like her, her intestines or whatever. There's just something ominous, man, about this. I'm always just his sitting there in that chair, man. Yeah. And the, I mean, the fact of the matter is, like, if someone came in here, if they didn't see him moving, they would just assume he was like a like a prop on the stage. Because with the mask and everything, everything just fits. You know, think about that scene in the sanitarium with the aquarium and yep. how this whole effect is really an aquarium of sorts. And the music almost makes you feel like you're underwater. Yeah, it really does. This looks so good. It really does. Freaking Lucifer, man. Yeah. I remember it. I think they used a large key for that effect. I would assume so, yeah. Mm. 
Ah, the game's afoot. <laughs> I wish he would have just thrown that cat, man. I don't know. I just I go over there. I mean, that would have been bad. I was kind of wonder why she didn't like, you know, she knew he was in the seat. Just kind of get below the seat and just aim upwards and just fire. Uh, probably not thinking that far ahead. Is it just me, or did that nail get a hell of a lot bigger? Yeah. Oh, this is so great, man. It is. I love the fact also that the axe is like, you know, like theatrically shaped, if you will. You know, it doesn't just look like your standard like fire axe or something. I like the attention to detail. You know, it's funny. I was just thinking how uh, it's funny how there was a moment when they were down on the bottom and looked up, and he was mm -hmm. up there, and it was like foreshadowed their doom. Like she's up there and he's looked up now. Yeah, it's kind of how things have been switched around. I, I wonder if it was. I'm I'm assuming it was probably intentional. No, maybe not. I don't know. He might have been better off just letting go when he was down there. Yeah. I mean, yeah, he'd have fallen a bit, but it wasn't like super big drop, was it? <laughs> really? Dude, strong, that's for sure. Yeah. Probably explains why it takes her, like, you know. 17 hits to cut through it where you know he can take a guy's head off with one shot <laughs> oh boom oh. it was that little jerk of the head when he yeah. when he hits you know that's that's kind of you know what does it it makes that scene just kind of more like oh Love the feathers just blowing. It's yeah, it's just such a damn great shot, isn't it? Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I always wonder that why when she was under the stage, she didn't, you know, try to get under the seat and fire up through it. But I guess you're probably not thinking that far ahead. <laughs> and that, my friends, is how Freddy Krueger really burned. <laughs> <laughs> they're surprised walking in there yeah like well excuse me officers uh what were you doing while this massacre was occurring you were eating donuts and trying to fix a car kind of oh i love that carrying the two body bags which you know are the two halves of that chick it's another beautiful shot yeah When you think of it, this would make a really good double feature with curtains. Here's another uh, interesting contrast. His breaking policy, letting them out, brings the killer in, but his uh, deciding to let her in will be the resolution that is needed. Yeah. Right between the eyes. <laughs> I shot him right between the eyes. <laughs> Would we call that stuff armchair quarterbacking? Yeah. <laughs> I love how it just takes its time. Yeah. This this is uh, your uh, 
your ending nod to the uh, giallos that were putting things together, pieces. Don't you worry about it. I'll do a voodoo ritual and make sure he doesn't come back. Ah, that watch went through so much. Yep. Right between the eyes. <laughs> All right, we got to talk about that for a minute. Yeah. I have heard um, in other, uh, um, well, the, they can remain nameless reviews mm -hmm. that just went on a just tearing that up, you know stupidest way to end the movie stupidest way don't understand it don't get it it <clears throat> doesn't make any well it makes all the sense in the world if you actually listen to McKaylee talk about his movie the mm -hmm. whole ending moment what had nothing to do with you know any sort of leaving the door open for um, Irving Wallace you know whether he was alive or not alive it was just a simple uh, wink, I think is how he put it, a wink at how the standard slasher film <laughs> always had that final moment where the yeah. killer came back. Yeah. And that's yeah. all it was meant to be. It was just a, uh, almost sort of a, a um, oh, parody is the right word, but a, sort of a... a, a like an homage. Yeah, or yeah, and not even in a serious way because you know, yeah, in in his mind, I mean, you know, this guy is dead. There's no sequel. This it's it is what it is. Yeah, and but I've I've heard people, and that's the thing. with sometimes you know, with these, <clears throat> with any film, but with an Italian film or any foreign film, you know, sometimes you know, sometimes you hear just you know judgments being made and. Ah, it's just so irritating. Yeah, and I mean, it's kind of like, think of the ending of Pieces. You know, there's no reason for that body to come alive, but, you know, it's there just for as like a little, you know, like a little sting, you know? It's, it's not actually happening or anything. Yeah, Same I mean, kind I just, of thing. I just, I just, uh, you know, I know. I think this this movie is a perfect. It is a. It, it, it's perfectly put in between. I mean, really, it's it's situated perfectly between two. Well, I mean, between. I think you said it better earlier. You know, it had it had this movie come out a few years earlier, it would have been perfectly situated between really two eras. But yeah, it it still comes at a point where it's recognizing the two eras that really have come yeah. before it, the uh, giallo and the uh, slasher. Mm 